the politics of history are everywhere and unavoidable. In the previous video, you saw illustrations uh, of this in terms of scenes from the musical 1776 and the song Sugar Trade written by Jimmy Buffett and James Taylor. These, these all have political or all deal with history and all have political uh, implications. And yet there is a belief that the, that politics should be removed from college courses, college instruction, that has no place in college instruction. Uh, I don't know how, as a practical matter, this could be accomplished in terms of history. I don't know how you would talk about Republican ideology, small r Republican ideology that informed the American Revolution. I don't see how you could talk about uh, the peaceful transfer of power in 1800 between um, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. I just I just don't see how you can get at these kinds of things um, without bringing into play um, some kind of political worldview. And it doesn't have to be the same political worldview, but I just think you know having some kind of worldview is unavoidable. Behind me uh, is the Ohio State House, where uh, in recent months, uh, an attempt has been made, uh, to create a law that, among other things, would make it, in effect, illegal uh, for instructors to talk about politics in the classroom and could lead to consequences um, such as their dismissal from the, uh, uh, from the university. And so this is one of the things that I think makes the discussion of the politics of history important because it is part of our present. It is, it is part of the current political dialogue. And so for this reason, this is another reason why I think it is really inescapable and needs to be uh, talked about. I'm gonna share the screen with you uh, and, and show you the terms for this, um, for this lecture. And as always, it's, a little awkward to get this thing up and running. I hate this part. Okay, finally, we've got it. So this lecture is called The Politics of History, Slavery in the American Colonial Period as a Case Study. So we're going to be doing, do, doing two things. We'll be talking about the politics of history, to be sure, but we're also going to be doing it in terms of a historical study uh, of slavery you know, during the colonial period, which is something we would do in any history. Uh, course. Here are the terms for uh, the lecture. And by the end of this presentation, this lecture, you should understand, actually there's a long list of things you need to understand. First, the concepts of historical objectivity and public memory. Now, these are covered in an earlier lecture, but they're central to this lecture as well. And so if you're not sure you have a clear handle on these concepts, go back, review them, um, until you do. The next thing is the concept of the politics of history. And this is just so central to the whole lecture that by the end of this presentation, you can, you can hardly do anything else but have, a, have this concept under control. And then I want you to understand um, your own personal thoughts, your own personal thinking, your own personal assessment of certain key question. The first is, does the teaching of history necessarily require viewing history through a political lens? I contend that it does, but that doesn't mean that I'm correct. If you agree, then why? And if you don't agree, then why not? Next, you know, what is the primary rationale for the teaching of history at the college level? And by way of example, possible responses would include, but aren't limited to, you could say, well, historical study is important as a means to develop critical thinking skills and better writing for that matter, or historical study as a means to espouse support or challenge an existing uh, public memory. And implicit in this is the idea that history has a role to play in terms of 
celebrating, for instance, the, na the national existence of the United States, and that to impeach this or to try to eradicate it or whatever uh, is something that is illegitimate um, and should not be part of uh, teaching uh, history. So the next thing is, is, what is meant by intellectual diversity? And this is included because uh, in the bill that's under discussion uh, in the Ohio Senate, um, the, the, the bill lays stress on this term intellectual diversity. And incidentally, just by way of editorial comment, I think that I think this idea of intellectual diversity has uh, has some real merit. It's one of the strengths of a bill, the bill, as far as I'm concerned. The next is the distinction between the presentation of an historical interpretation with political implications. In other words, exposing students to, you know, to the fact that this interpretation exists so that they're aware of it and understand what it's about. That's on the one hand, but then on the other hand, where does that elide into historical indoctrination that essentially attempts to force students to accept that interpretation? So that I'm, so that in fact, I'm not just sort of letting you know that this historical interpretation is out there. I'm basically demanding that you accept this interpretation um, you know, not, not exactly as fact, but it's something that you accept and that you embrace. And I guess, in, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the sort of the nightmare scenario, your, your grade depends upon, you know, examinations in which you sort of regurgitate um, my view of, of an historical inter interpretation. Um, so, and the list doesn't end there. Um, there's certain factual things that need to be done. The numbers of Africans brought to the Western Hemisphere as slaves. This is this is just simply an important historical fact. The characteristics of the Middle Passage um, across the Atlantic. Uh, next, a basic understanding of the 1619 project, which is going to figure prominently in this lecture. Understanding of it as an attempt to challenge the dominant public memory of the origins of American society and values, which I think I would argue, and many Americans would argue, that moment would be 1776 with American independence. Others might argue that it'd be 1620 with the arrival of, uh, of the pilgrims. Um, but regardless, you know, the 1619 project basically says, no, you know, that the, the public memory uh, with which she, we should be engaged, really needs to recognize the centrality of slavery and the origins of American society and, uh, and values. Next, I need you to understand the importance of Bacon's rebellion to the invention of white racism. During the English colonization period, in the early stages, white racism really didn't exist. Heck, you know, uh, the, the idea of being white as an important expression of one's identity did not uh, yet exist. So this, so there was a point in time when um, whiteness came to, you know, to, to be introduced and to have meaning, and white racism emerges, and and this is connected in Virginia with Bacon's Rebellion. So I need you to know about that. Then there's the, the kind of the concept of white privilege. Um, which is you know one of those one of those terms that's out there and um, um, I think not terribly well um, understood. I'm going to try to make the concept clear. And again, it's not a matter of you know you need to accept it or not accept it. You know, but you but it's important for you to understand what the concept means. So. Next. The distinction between a society that has enslaved persons and a society that depends upon enslavement as the, the basis for economic and political viability. To the American Revolution, um, all colonies had enslaved persons. Massachusetts did, Rhode Island did, New York did, and so forth and so on. But these, these colonies didn't depend upon slavery for their economic viability. On the other hand, uh, Southern colonies, Virginia, the two Carolinas um, in particular, 
did depend upon enslavement as you know a system of labor without which uh, it was simply not possible uh, for those colonies to produce the uh, the agricultural products that were uh, fundamental to the wealth that they were ever uh, able to generate. And then finally, I want you to know about the, the 1977 television miniseries Roots. And to make you acquainted with its portrayal of slavery and also its impact on American society, uh, which was surprisingly powerful and I think lasting. I think, I think a whole generation of Americans acquired their understanding of slavery and the experience of slavery from watching that miniseries, Roots. Now, with regard to um, Ohio Senate Bill 83, which is the one that I'm have, have talked about and the the the, the, uh, the bill that's being discussed out of the Ohio Senate, okay, in, in a pretty in a, in a pretty significant sort of way, this is a television news story um, from um, a Cleveland television station from earlier uh, in 2023. And it's short enough, and you know that doesn't take too much time to uh, go through. And it's informative about the basics of what the bill is about, and why some people favor it and other people are opposed to it. We just need to make sure that the environment, and in addition to those great programs, that the environment is conducive to students being taught how to think, not what to think. Major changes could be on the way for Ohio's public colleges and universities. This after the state senate passed a bill that targets the way college campuses run. Yesterday's vote comes a week after lawmakers made some tweaks and clarifications to the measure. Carmen Blackwell spoke with the sponsor of the bill and has details on what it could mean for higher education in Ohio. On Wednesday, the Ohio Senate passed SB 83, which would restrict mandatory diversity training, ban faculty strikes, and penalize professors who failed to create classrooms free of bias. The lead item in the bill was to make sure that our universities and community colleges are beacons of free speech, that we do not have restricted speech that everybody uh, can can voice their views. Introduced and sponsored by 18th District yeah. Senator Jerry Serino, the measure would restrict programs that partner with Chinese schools. It would also ban diversity training, make American history courses mandatory, and mandate tenure evaluations based on if the educator showed bias or taught with bias. He says SB 83 protects a student's civil right of the First Amendment. Nobody should hold back on their expressing their opinions and should feel comfortable uh, arguing and debating and uh, dealing with um, issues that are important to them. The legislation would also reduce term limits for board of trustee members from nine years to four. Before passing, SB 83 underwent some major revisions, including clarifying that the segregation of faculty and staff based on someone's race, ethnicity, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression, prohibiting it in classroom settings, orientations, and graduations. But critics of SB 83 say the bill aims to solve the wrong problem and believe it will make people think twice about teaching and attending college in Ohio. Today, the Ohio State University came out against the measure, issuing a statement that says in part, quote, we acknowledge the issues raised by this proposal, but believe there are alternative solutions that will not undermine the shared governance model of universities, risk weakened academic rigor, or impose extensive and expensive new reporting mandates. Uh, Russ, the bill now heads to the Ohio House, and the Chronicle of Higher Education says more than 30 anti-DEI bills have been introduced across several states, and that includes Florida, Russ. Mm, Carmen Blackwell, thank you. You got it.